Welcome to MacArthur Salvation Army's online worship. We are so glad that you have joined us for online worship today. Today we are taking a step away from our journey through Exodus, our series on Into the Unknown, led by Nicola, and we are coming to you with a service led by our youth. We are so excited to be presenting this finally after weeks of work, um, and we really hope that you are blessed today. We hope that you would see Jesus through the eyes of a child in a different way um, than what you might have before. So we ask that you would keep watching. We, are, we have worked really hard to produce this. Um, and look, we're, we're giving it you our best. So I ask that you would really just centre yourselves today, that you would focus on Jesus. Come back to the heart of worship where our spirit is singing to God. And let's sing the heart of worship. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to breathe something that's a word.
you now with that promise that we are yours and you are ours and Lord in this time of mystery and uncertainty where fear is surrounding us where life is getting crazy once again with unknown we want to take a second now to stop and remember that you are in all of that no matter what's going on in this world at the moment you have your hand on it. And so now, Lord, I want to pray for your hand of guidance on those who are making decisions for us, who are trying to do the best they can for us. We pray for your hand of protection on our frontline workers who have no choice but to go into work every day and look after people who very well could make them sick. We think of those who are feeling trapped in how life is at the moment. We pray that you will give them strength to know that this is not the end. Life will become a normal again. We just have to trust and hope and pray that you will be in that situation. We want to thank you that we are still able to worship, even though worship looks a little different. We want to thank you 
for the message that you've put into the hearts of Sharice and Edwin for today. We pray that people's hearts will be open to hearing what you want them to hear. And we thank you for this opportunity that we, the young people of this core, have got to share Jesus today. Amen. Our first Bible reading comes from Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, to Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wicked wi- because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. Eh. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let's cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord, because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they didn't, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. May God bless the reading. A few weeks ago, I participated in an online games night with a few friends from the extended Salvation Army world via Zoom. And we were playing a game similar to the card game Mafia. For those of you who have no clue what I'm talking about, as I didn't before I started playing this game, each player gets assigned a role by the card that they draw. The aim is basically to see through people's bluff, watching their actions and reactions to things said in the group. And then in the allocated time, all of the players must try to come to a consensus as to who has drawn the card that makes them the mafia, based on their observation of each of the other players. My friend Kieran was convinced that our friend Chloe was the mafia, but... Kieran has been known to mess with me quite a bit and so I did not believe him. In fact, I thought that he was trying to fool me into thinking that he was not the mafia. So when it came time for us to vote, I voted for him. Long story short, I ended up losing the game because Chloe was in fact the mafia. Though I had not played the game very much before and I really didn't know what I was doing, I trusted my own judgment rather than a seasoned professional's ultimately resulting in the loss. A life guided by self will lead us into turbulence. In the reading we just heard, read by Lizzie, from the first chapter of Jonah, God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. 
and preach against it because of its wickedness. Nineveh was the capital of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and this empire was known for its terrorising military tactics. It had a reputation for overthrowing the smaller countries and dispersing their people all throughout the land, never to be reunited again. So when Jonah was called there, you would imagine his reluctancy to go there. Although he had heard the call of God, you know, the big voice from heaven saying, go to Nineveh and preach against their wickedness, he was not going of his own accord. He may not have trusted God to protect him and guide him. And obedience is based on trust, right? Maybe he was thinking of his own self-preservation, as I'm sure many of us would. So he relies on his own direction and his own judgment. He goes to the port at Joppa as we heard in the Bible reading, where all the ships would come in and out, transporting cargo or people between places. I picture this scene like that of the movies. Jonah is so frightened, he wants to escape the voice of God. And so with people milling around him, you know, things, commotions happening around him at the port, many people are ringing in his ears, tunneled and blurry vision. He's just stumbling onto this port and eventually onto a boat the first boat that he sees. Of course, this is just the makings of my imagination. However it happened, he ends up on a ship headed to Tarshish. Tarshish was 200, two, sorry, 2,200 miles from Joppa, where Nineveh was only 600 miles. For reference, that's like here in Norellan to Brisbane. God called me there. But instead, I decide I'm going to go flee to Perth. Jonah was willing to travel almost four times the distance to escape from God's calling. But this leads him into the turbulent waters of a great storm. In chapter 1 verse 4 we read, Then the Lord sent a great wind and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Jonah had relied on himself for guidance and here he finds himself in a deal of great danger. A life guided by self will lead us to turbulent waters. A life guided by self will lead us into turbulence. We cannot rely on ourselves, though, to escape this turbulence. In verse 4, the fear that the sailors had, they were so terrified of the waters raging around them. And so I would be if I were in the same situation, in a boat that is relying on its holding together to keep me aboard. So whilst Jonah is snoring away in the ship's hold, these sailors begin throwing their cargo overboard and casting lots and calling out to their own gods, hoping that one of them would listen and calm the seas. But of course, nothing happened. There is only one God who can speak and calm the seas. And we heard that last week. And when that didn't work, We see in verse 7, they started casting lots, the equivalent of rolling dice, to see whose God, little g, was responsible for the calamity. They were relying on themselves to rectify the turbulence. The scripture reading tells us that the lot fell on Jonah and they start interrogating him. And again, like that of the movies, where are you from? Who are you and what do you do? What God do you worship? And he says, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the seas and the dry land. And he says, throw me into the sea and the waters will become calm. And still, even after his instruction, they make attempts to escape the turbulent waters of their own accord, as if they hadn't learnt. They tried rowing back to land. And I could imagine how tough that would be in the midst of a great storm. It is obvious that they made their own attempts to rectify their situation lost in turbulent waters. They will not work though. So they throw Jonah overboard, reluctant though, as they thought that God might then put his wrath on them. This was an act of physical surrender from Jonah though. Throw me overboard and the waters will calm. He did not know that, that God was going to save him. Jonah's story does not end here. Instead of letting him drown, God sends Jonah an uber or a blubber, like blubber, 
Okay, not quite, but my sister told me to use that one, so I'm going to blame it on her. I'd encourage you to read chapter 2 of Jonah, and I really enjoy the voice translation of the Bible, which narrates his prayer in the belly of a great fish, his cry out to God. In verse 2, he prays, with desperate cries, I beckoned to the eternal to hear. And he answered me, from the belly, the place of death, I cried out to you, Lord. This prayer in the middle of his distress is another one of surrender. Surrender provides direction to all aspects of our lives. I've seen it in people close to me and I've seen it in myself as well. It is only when we surrender to the voice of God that we are able to be directed. Of course, surrender can take many forms, physical or spiritual. It doesn't have to come all at once either. And neither will the surrender of a newborn Christian look the same as that of lovely old Heather sitting in the front row of your church who has followed God for what feels like a hundred years. God bless all you Heathers out there. In verse 5, Jonah prays, The waters swallowed me. The deep abyss was covering me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head and I sank down to where the mountains are rooted to the earth. Quite vivid imagery there. And it goes on to say, Yet you, my Lord, you lifted me up from the pit. My prayer rose to you in your holy temple. But I will sing to you and sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. And Jonah was directed by his sacrifice, both in the first and the second instances. The Lord commands the fish to spit Jonah out onto the shore. When we are surrounded by deep waters, surrender should be our compass. Instead of charting our own course, giving of our issues, our fears and our lives to Jesus, surrendering all to him. Whether you feel as though you are drowning in depression or addiction, overcome by anxiety or particularly in this season alone, and unable to do the things that regularly would bring you joy. I know I found myself in that place. Surrender should be your compass, providing you with direction. My pop always said this phrase that has stuck with me until this day. Let go and let God. In other words, surrender and let God direct you. When we are surrounded by deep waters, surrender should be our compass.
kids. Welcome to Kids Time this week. If you don't know me or my pretty face, my name is Abby and it is a privilege of mine to attend the Salvo at MacArthur. Now, for some of you, I did get to see you this week, which was so fun because I miss seeing your beautiful faces. But can you do me a big favour and give me the biggest air high five you can? All right, ready? One, two, three. I hardly felt that, guys. I'm a little disappointed. Can we go again? Yeah, cool. Ready? One, as hard as you can. One, two, three. Ow, that was like Doug high-fiving me. That hurt. Okay, I'm going to have to take a minute to recover from that one. This week in church, we have been looking at a guy named Jonah. Now, Sharice told us that he was a prophet, one of God's very special messengers. And God wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah said, no, like, I don't want to go. So he went the opposite direction to a place called Tarshish. Try saying that 10 times fast. I'm not going to. I'd make a fool of myself. So he got on a boat, headed to Tarshish. There was a storm. Ah, we're all going to drown. Big fish got swallowed by the big fish. And that's where kids' time comes in. You are going to need a few things. Firstly, some sticky tape. If you have a funky dispenser, go for it. Some tiny teddies. Any flavour your little heart desires, I hear honey is the best. A paper plate. Cut into fish fins. You can decorate them if you would like. A balloon. A text up. Permanent markers would probably work best. Some scissors. And because we have a permanent marker and scissors, we need an adult. So, you've got until we count down from 10 to go and get what you need and I will see you very soon. Now, I have everything I need except for my adult. Yes, I am an adult. Two plus two equals four, so not an adult. Nicola, would you be my adult? Thank you. Okay. Now, kids, this is where you're going to need your tiny teddies. I've already opened mine for the sake of being fast. Tiny teddies. You only need one. So bonus, you get to eat the rest of the packet. Now, Nicola, would you please take a tiny teddy and that balloon? It's always <laughs> it is. We have learnt that from prior experience. And um, we need that. Well, you can take another one if you want to eat it. <laughs> um, and we need that bal- tiny teddy to go in the opening of the balloon. A bit fiddly, you might want to put mum and dad to good use about now. How far down? He needs to go into the, the ba- like big bit of the balloon. Okay. Yeah, he needs to go far down. <laughs> it was a lot quicker when I did this at home with no pressure whatsoever. Okay, he's getting there. He's almost in the belly of the, the balloon. balloon. <laughs> okay. Yep. Nearly there? Got All right. Got Now, because you're such a pro at blowing up balloons, Nicola, and you have singer's lungs as big as you can get it, and then tie them up. Can we have some cheering from the peanut gallery, please? I mean, if you want to. Go hard or go home. (laughs) Yep, absolutely. Okay. This, again, you might need mum and dad's help tying things up. Now, while Nicola's tying it up, paper plate needs to be cut into fins. And you can kind of see here, I decorated mine in a rush. I had decorated another one really pretty and colourful and left it at home because I'm really smart like that. Decorate your fish's fins because we want him to be pretty. Okay. And then we're going to stick the fin onto the balloon. Like that. That's perfect. 
Oh. Okay, that's one. That's one side. And then the other side. Yeah, that's good. And then the little itty bitty fin is going to go for the tail of our fish. You could do it a little bigger than this. Oh, thank you. That's all the sticky tape I need. Okay, cool. Excellent. Nicola's very helpful. She's a very helpful adult. There we go. Now our fish has fins. Oh, we, yep. So, all right. To give our fish some life, because I'm sure the fish that we had in Jonah was the life of the party or the sea, you decide. We're going to give him some eyes. I'm not an artist at any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> it really is. Uh, yeah, it has some little eyelashes because it's a girl. And we need a big smile. No one comment that this looks bad, okay? Because I know. There we go. We, you sure can. Let's get a close-up of our fish. I hope, I mean, yours probably looks a lot better than mine. Because like I said, not an artist at all. That's my little sister's job. <laughs> all right. Now, you can't see him from the front, but you can see him from underneath, which we're not going to get a good shot of. But we have a tiny teddy, a little Jonah, in the whale. That's pretty fun. All right, thank you so much, kids, for joining me. We're going to hear very soon what happened to Jonah in the belly of the whale when Edwin brings us the next part of our message. But now we're going to have some fun with a really cool song called In the Belly of the Whale. You may have heard this one before from Veggie Tales, because who loves Veggie Tales? I do. Have fun with us as we sing In the Belly of the Whale. was reading earlier we're reading from Jonah chapter 3 verse 4 
Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days, Nineveh will overturn. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them, from the greatest to least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger to that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from the evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarnish. I knew that your gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in love, a God who relents from sending clemency. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you got any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat at a place east of the city. There he made himself shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, warm worm, sorry, which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have any right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said, I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, though you do not tend or make it grow. It sprung up overnight and died overnight. But none of it has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? May the God be with you this week. Uh, Thank you, Leah, for the Bible reading. Right, quick recap. Jonah ran away. He gets into a storm and is eaten by a whale. And three days later, he spat out again. So, after Jonah had a whale of a time under the sea, the Lord decreed to him to travel to Nineveh and spread his message of repentance to the people. After Jonah delivered the Lord's decree, he waited outside the city for its destruction. And as we read further on in chapter 4, Nineveh was spared, and Jonah became angry about the Lord sparing the people and the city. So why was Nineveh spared from its destruction? Now, through the Bible, there's a phrase that is mentioned about the Lord, and it's even in Jonah's prayer. Lord, you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. That second part of the prayer is important. A God who relents from sending calamity, a God who relents from sending disaster, from sending his wrath, sending his judgment. 
Because of his mercy, his love, his grace, and his compassion, we are spared from his wrath. And as Captain said last week, before God passes his judgment, he always gives a chance to show his mercy. So, God's mercy is something else. It is more than a kindly forbearance, more than self-control or restraint. His mercy allows us to do two things. It allows us to repent for our sins or past transgressions, and his mercy gives us a second chance. Now that we know what the Lord's mercy provides, I have a question for you. Do you know what the definition of mercy is? According to the dictionary, mercy is kindly forbearance towards one's enemies or a person in one's power. We have all read about what the Lord can do to our enemies or to those who are wicked. Noah and the flood, the ten plagues of Egypt, Sodom and Gomorrah, these people were destroyed by the Lord. However, Jonah tells of something different. God showed mercy to the Ninevites. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. These are the same people who just earlier the Lord was telling Jonah that they would be destroyed because, they, because of their wickedness, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, just like the flood. However, God's mercy is on show here. In Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham bartered with the Lord to spare the city if 50 people were shown to be holy. Obviously, we know what happens to that city. Only one of those people were holy, and that was Lot. The ten plagues of Egypt, well, we've been going through that the past couple of weeks, but there's a particular phrase that, has, that shows his mercy. Let my people go so that they may worship me. Or, it's the word or and if that comes to attention in Genesis and Exodus. God doesn't need an excuse or a reason to wipe out the Ninevites, Sodom and Gomorrah, or the Egyptians. However, because the Ninevites repented, the Lord showed his mercy upon them. Isaiah 55, 7 provides a glimpse into his mercy towards them. Let the wicked forsake their ways, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. This is the mercy of the Lord. When the Ninevites were repented and were genuine in their repentance, the Lord spared them of being wiped out. He offered them a second chance. <coughs> Sorry about that. This second chance also gives an insight into his compassion. The Lord's compassion and love will never fail. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. So, I have another question for you. What is the definition of compassion? Compassion is the pity or concern for the suffering of others. The Lord's compassion is something else entirely. No matter our mistakes or our sins, he still loves us. His love, mercy, and compassion are never-ending. Now, Psalm 145, verses 8 to 9, also highlights Jonah's prayer. And it also highlights the Lord's compassion for us, his creation. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Now, in the story of Jonah, the Lord showed compassion three times. On the boat, to the sailors by stopping the storm after they threw Jonah overboard. To Jonah himself, providing the whale and the vine. And to Nineveh, sparing the city after it repented. Now, even though Jonah has been shown this compassion, the whale, the vine, he did not have compassion or mercy for the Ninevites. He actually sat down and waited for the destruction of Nineveh. Now, at this point, I picture someone with a magnifying glass holding it up to the sun like you do to ants and watching him burn. <clears throat> However, here's the irony in Jonah's situation. He says that exact same prayer, you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. There it is. He's compassionate. He relents from sending disaster, calamity, destruction. And yet, 
Jonah was so angry that the Lord spared the Ninevites that he wanted to die. He says that the Lord is compassionate. However, his human mind and in his way of thinking, he does not want the Lord to have compassion or mercy over the Ninevites. Now, in reading Matthew Henry's commentary, he states that Jonah was angry because he was jealous of Nineveh repenting, because the Lord had shown to a nation that wasn't Israel favour. Now, after Jonah's little temper tantrum at the start of chapter 4, the Lord showed Jonah a lesson in compassion by growing a plant for Jonah to have shelter from the elements. After a day, God provided a worm to, to cause the plant to die for a dry easterly and a hot summer day to cause Jonah discomfort. And again, Jonah said that he wanted to die. Now, the Lord's answer to Jonah's little tizzy is that you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concerned for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many animals. Jonah's concerned about a tiny plant. He, had, he didn't tend to it, he didn't make it grow, he did not do anything to it. The Lord provided it out of compassion for him. So if that's a tiny plant Jonah's got compassion for, why shouldn't he have compassion for the 120,000 people and who knows how many animals, plants, children? <clears throat> Here's the thing. Jonah's anger towards the Lord, sparing of Nineveh, is a human response based on emotion. He shouldn't be angry. He should be happy. People repented and were saved. After all, that's, that's what we believe. That is the message. <clears throat> they turned to the Lord. That's not a reason to be angry. It's a reason to rejoice. The city repented and the Lord relented his judgment, <clears throat> showing his compassion. God's mercy and compassion are greater than what we can comprehend. We can't begin to understand it. We can't begin to accept how great it is and accept how simple it is. It's infinite. It's never drying. So great his compassion and mercy is that the ultimate act of it is that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us all, for all our sins. It just blows your mind. You know, here's a Lord who, the flood, Noah, Sodom and Gomorrah, ten plagues of Egypt, he can do all that in a click of his finger. And yet, his ultimate act of mercy and compassion for us is Jesus on the cross. <clears throat> Our chains are gone. We've been set free. My Lord, my Saviour has ransomed me. As we sing Amazing Grace, <clears throat> let us remember that. His mercy, His compassion, His love, His grace, everything the Lord is, it's all for us. <clears throat> may we remember that and may it always be in the front of our minds, in the back of our minds, every single day. <clears throat> Thank you.
we've just heard that the power of God's love can save cities, can spring roots up from the earth to provide shelter for a man who is scorching in the heat. What else can the power of God's love do? Is it enough to keep us from dying? Well, yes, because Jesus died on the cross to save us, right? That was from the power of God's love. As we sing this, I'd invite you to think about that. What else can the power of God's love do? Last week we heard what the power of God can do and if, if God is not God, then he does not love. Love is what drives God to do things for us. So let's sing the power of your love.
Hallelujah! How amazing was that? Well, I leave with you this benediction from Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 to 6. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We hope you can join us for next week for online worship.